Good morning, church. Where he leads, I'll follow. Amen to that. You don't know where you, you don't have to know, as they say, you don't have to know where you're going if you know whom you are following. If you're following Jesus Christ, then you don't have to be you don't have to worry because you know you're in good hands. Um, it caught my attention when uh, I was talking to uh, brother, brother Tony a while ago. He asked me, how are you doing? And I told him, I'm so blessed. And he said to me, by the best. <laughs> Amen to that. Amen to that. You know, we, we are truly blessed every day. Um, every morning is a blessing from God because we are blessed by none other than the best. Okay. Now, um, this morning, you know, we'll be talking about opportunity. Jesus' death is an opportunity for all of us um, to be with him, to be with God the Father, and to be with the Holy Spirit in heaven someday. And um, this morning, we will look into the story in the Bible and try to see it from a different perspective by examining, you know, by examining it in the light of our salvation. And uh, we will go to the story of two sisters. And I know you're pretty much um, familiar with the story of Martha and Mary. So this morning, we will go to look at the story of these two sisters in the light of our salvation. So Martha and Mary, a lesson on <clears throat> salvation. In Luke chapter 10, verses 38 and 39a, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. You know, the, the first encounter, um, this was actually the first encounter of Martha and Mary with Jesus Christ. Now, it was assumed that Mary knew about Jesus Christ for she opened the door for Jesus. And then uh, she acknowledges, you know, the, uh, that, he had, that he had known Jesus Christ by opening her door. Her knowledge of Jesus Christ wasn't really something that was personal at that time because she hadn't met Jesus Christ at that time. And it, this is the first time that Mary and Martha uh, met Jesus Christ. So she probably heard him, probably heard the name Jesus Christ because at that time, Jesus Christ was becoming popular. And, uh, and Jesus Christ, he was making a buzz in the community. He's becoming famous at that time. Then um, learning that Jesus was coming into their village, into the town, Martha invited Jesus and opened their house to him. You see, we must see an opportunity in everything. Again, salvation is an opportunity for us to be with God in heaven someday. Every day in our lives, there would, there would be an opportunity that would present itself. And Martha saw an opportunity when she heard and she learned that Jesus Christ was coming to their town. She saw something about Jesus that most people didn't see. Because going to the town, it was Martha, probably with so many uh, houses in that community, it was Martha who opened her door to Jesus Christ. Because she, she, she saw something in Jesus Christ. She saw an opportunity. Now look at what... Uh, Mary did. When Martha opened the door, Mary sat at the Lord's feet and she listened. She listened. Mary knew that it was an opportunity of a lifetime to learn from the master himself. When they opened the door, Mary sat in front of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now it is important to know that it was part of tradition and culture at that time that women, they were good for you know household chores, 
And uh, they're not really given that opportunity to study. And it was reserved for men. And even until um, I, I've read an article, even today in some uh, other uh, part in the Middle East, that uh, education are still reserved for men. Okay. So at that time, it was part of the culture that women should not be sitting in front with men and they should be at the kitchen. Okay. Now, studying and learning is more of man's role rather than women's role. Now, to be sitting there with Jesus Christ and other men was not a typical scenario at that time. But Mary chose to sit down among them and listen to Jesus Christ. Now, again, it was an opportunity for her, an opportunity of a lifetime. So she was probably thinking, why blew it away? If I have the master in our house, then I would sit right there and listen to him. Now, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 tells us, But we see him, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor, because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death, for everyone. Now, this is how they saw Jesus Christ. Okay. The word we see, but we see him, the word we see, you know, the book of Hebrews was written for the, for the Jewish audience, okay, for the Jewish converts. So the word we see refers to the Jewish converts. Now, they saw him, they saw Jesus crowned with glory and honor, because of the suffering of death. Now, they did not literally, you know, see Jesus with the crown. It's not literal. But seeing him with crown and glory means they regarded Jesus with the highest honor because of what he did and what he brought to them. So it was more of a metaphor. And what he gave to them is eternal life. And now these Jewish converts, they saw an opportunity, an opportunity in Jesus. That's why they accepted him. They saw that opportunity. Now, if the Jewish converts saw Jesus this way, the question is, how do you see Jesus? If they saw Jesus being crowned, having that glory and honor, because of what Jesus did and what Jesus brings to them. How do you see Jesus? Now to properly, uh, for a man to see clearly, you know, they say you, have, you must have a 2020 vision, right? So we must have a 2020 vision to see clearly Jesus Christ. Now, I have called this the 2020 vision concept. The first is, the first 20 is you must see Jesus through the eyes of your heart. Use the eyes of your heart. Use your heart to see Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, Though you have not seen him, who among us have seen Jesus Christ alive? None. But in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. The 2020 concept, vision concept, it does not embrace the saying, to cease to believe. We don't embrace that. Because none of us here ever saw Jesus Christ. But we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe through the eyes of our hearts. To see Jesus, one must use his heart, her heart. It says that though you do not see him, you love him. 
See Jesus through the eyes of your heart. See Jesus through your affections. Use your affections. Use your emotions. Use your heart to see Jesus Christ. So that's the first part of the 2020 vision concept. See Jesus through the eyes of your heart. Now the second 20 is you must see Jesus through the eyes of your understanding. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18 the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. In other translation, the eyes of your love, the eyes of your heart. But in this particular version, and it and in the original Greek, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The 2020 concept of vision concept is also about seeing with the eyes of our understanding. Number one, seeing through the eyes of our hearts. Number two is seeing with the eyes of our understanding. It means our reasoning. It means our thoughts. It means our intellect. By seeing with the eyes of our understanding, we will clearly see that what a great opportunity there is in Jesus Christ. Now it says you will know that you have what? That you have hope. By opening the eyes of your understanding, you will know that you will have hope. And it says again that uh, the hope that you have, the hope that is there, it is about our future state. What will become of you in the future? And isn't that amazing and wonderful that all of us here who opened our hearts to Jesus Christ, we have that hope in the future. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Brothers, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you will not grieve like the rest who are without hope. By having Jesus Christ into your lives, you have hope. Then again, according to Apostle Paul, those, the rest, who sleep, they will grieve. Those who do not have <clears throat> Jesus Christ, they will grieve because they are without hope. Now, <clears throat> Paul said that they will, those who have hope, they will not grieve. But those who do not hope, it's the other way around, they will grieve because they have no hope. And that is clear. Now, part of Paul's message, so that the Thessalonian brethren, it says so that they won't be uninformed. And it was regarding the hope that they have in Jesus Christ since Jesus died and Jesus rose again from the grave. And they too, according to Apostle Paul, will be raised with him when they die. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we also believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Paul was trying to convey to the Thessalonian brethren this message, he doesn't want them to be uninformed of the kind of hope that they have in Jesus Christ. When they accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, they have that opportunity to be with God in heaven someday because of that hope. And that's why Paul insisted, I don't want you to be uninformed like those who do not have Christ in their lives. They will grieve. But you, you will not grieve because you have now, as you open the eyes of your understanding and see how important Jesus is in your life, you will know that, number one, that you will have hope. I hope you know that you have hope in Jesus Christ. And number two is that you will know that you will inherit, you will inherit a one-of-a-kind riches in Jesus Christ. 
and that is the promise that we all have from God. Now, God gave us the opportunity to have eternal life through Jesus Christ. It is now up to us how we see Jesus. Martha, knowing that Jesus was coming into the town, saw an opportunity. That's why she opened up her door. Now that you see an opportunity, now that there is an opportunity in front of you, what are you going to do? Open your door, grab it. Take that opportunity. It might not come again. No. Take that opportunity. When you have heard the message of God, grab that opportunity that someone is telling you the good news. Because you don't know. Tomorrow might be too late for you. You don't know when will you breathe your last. So when you have that opportunity, open your door and grab it. When Martha saw this opportunity, she grabbed it. She grabbed it, she opened her door. And she was able to have Jesus in her house, probably with other people from the neighborhood coming into their house and listening to Jesus Christ. Now, how was she able to have Jesus and, and his entourage come into her home? We do not know. Probably she sent words to the apostles. She sent words to Jesus Christ telling Jesus Christ, when you come into the, to this village, please come to my house. We don't know that. But one thing is for sure, one thing that we know, when Jesus Christ came into his, to her hometown, she opened up her door. Now probably, some, some thought that probably when Jesus Christ was coming uh, closer to her house, she was probably shouting the name of Jesus. And she was probably jumping up and down, trying to make a scene so that Jesus could, you know, notice her. But whatever it is, she saw an opportunity in Jesus Christ. And she opened up her door. Now, how can you tell, there's a question, how can you tell when something that comes your way is an opportunity or not? Let me repeat the question. How can you tell when something that comes your way is an opportunity or not? The key word is value. The benefit. The benefit you will get from that something. Okay. Now, it is an opportunity when you see a benefit in and from it. If you see the value of that thing. You know, you heard the saying... One man's trash is another man's treasure. Right? Now, I remember back home uh, in my hometown seeing someone. He, he, he threw a plank of wood in, the, in front of, of his house. And I was standing across the street. And I was waiting for someone, you know, probably some, somebody would pick it up. And then after quite a while, many people passed by, they ignored the plank of wood. And I was thankful for that because I need that plank of wood. And when somebody, you know, didn't notice it, I went to that wood, picked it up, put it to my car, and drove away. Because for me, that plank of wood, I saw an opportunity in that plank of wood. Because at that time, I was doing some carpentry works. And I needed a plank of wood. And it so happened while I was walking, I saw that plank of wood. You see, for me, that plank of wood is something of value. I saw an opportunity in that wood. But those many people that passes by, for them, it's just an ordinary trash. An opportunity is an opportunity when there is some of, when there is a value to you. When you see a benefit from it. You see, when I took that home, I was so happy because, you know, I saved some money. 
For me, it was a treasure, but for that man who threw that plank of wood, it was a trash to him. So one man's trash is another man's treasure. It is the same way with Jesus Christ. If you do not see any benefits from Jesus Christ, having him in your life, you will just like be those other people who just passes by the, by the plank of wood. You will just pass by Jesus Christ and will never take notice of him because for you, Jesus Christ is nothing. But for those who see Jesus Christ as something that's of benefit with them, they are seeing an opportunity with Jesus Christ. So when you see something, you can tell that something is an opportunity when you saw a benefit from it. That's why I asked a while ago, how do you see Jesus Christ in your life? No. Martha saw an opportunity in Jesus. She opened the door of her house so that the master can come in to their house and could share the gospel of salvation. And whoever that is with them in their house, they benefit from the gesture of Martha. You know, Martha saw the value. Martha saw the benefit of having Jesus in their home. Even if we see Jesus, you know, as an opportunity, here's another thing. Even if you see Jesus as an opportunity, if we do nothing, if we don't do anything, then Jesus Christ will be useless to you. It is not what you know. It is what you do with what you know. It is what you do with what you have that is more important. In the parable of the lost coin, we are all familiar with the parable of the lost coin. You know, the woman, he put aside, what, the 99 coins and <clears throat> painstakingly looked for that one coin that was missing. But we, we ask, but why? She still have the 99. See, but why is that woman would still look for the one coin that was missing? Because the one coin is of value to her. It is something of value to that woman. You know, that woman, she would not use her time looking for that one coin if she didn't see any value to that coin. Remember that Jesus Christ came to seek and save the lost. Jesus Christ came to seek all of us because we are lost. If we are not important to God, then we are still at a loss until this very day. If we are not valuable to God, then Jesus would not have come and died on the cross for all of us. But because we are so valuable to God, he let his son, his only son, his only begotten son died on the cross for you and I because we are that so important to him. And that woman, that one coin is so important to her, that's why she looked all over the place just for that one coin. Do you see how really important you are in Jesus? He died for you. Another question is, do you see the value of Jesus in your life? Because if you do, you will open the doors of your heart to him and let him come in and dine with you. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. If you see that Jesus Christ is so important to you, then why wait? Why wait? If he is important to you right now, why wait till tomorrow for tomorrow may not come? Repent and be baptized. That's the calling of the gospel. Today, when you hear his words, when you hear his name, do not harden your heart. That's the call for all of us. For those who have not yet accepted the Lord, 
Why wait till tomorrow? For tomorrow may not come. See the opportunity. And seize the opportunity when you see one. Open the doors of your heart to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is giving us an opportunity of a lifetime to be with them in heaven someday. Now, when you see an opportunity, the next part that we can learn from Martha and Mary is focus on the visitor. Focus on the visitor. Verse 39 and 48, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that he had to be made. Now that you have that opportunity, that something that is of value, that is now in your hands, now for sure you don't want to let it go. You don't want that opportunity of a lifetime to let it go, to let it slip those fingers of yours. Now in the case of Mary, she saw an opportunity. You know, she could have, uh, she could have heard many good things about Jesus Christ. She could have heard important things about Jesus Christ. That's why when Jesus Christ came into their home, she immediately sat and listened to Jesus Christ. She could have helped her sister Martha in the kitchen, but she didn't. She saw an opportunity and focused on that opportunity, focused on Jesus Christ. She left everything. Probably she was doing something in the kitchen or probably something, uh, doing something at the backyard. But when Jesus Christ came in, she left everything, whatever she was doing, and she took a front row seat listening to Jesus Christ. She grabs that opportunity and focuses on that opportunity, focuses on that visitor, focuses on that Jesus Christ. The apostles... They saw the value of Jesus. You know, and when they found Jesus Christ, it was a treasure to them. They don't want the treasure to slip the fingers of their hands. Now, the following verse that we're going to read is a profound statement from Peter that speaks highly of the value of Jesus Christ to them. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom will we go now listen to these words you have what you have the words of eternal life you see they saw the value of jesus christ that's why peter said to whom we will go nobody except you why because you have the words of eternal life the spirit gives life the flesh profits nothing. The words I've spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Amen to that. You see, Peter and the apostles saw a great treasure in Jesus Christ. They have learned that Jesus is the life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the living water. So when you're hungry, you have Jesus, the bread of life. If you are thirsty, you have Jesus, the living water. What else could you ask for? Nothing. When you have Jesus, you have everything. You have everything. Apostle Paul, surrendering his life to Jesus, said these words in Philippians chapter 1, 21. For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Apostle Paul, he was so willing to die for Jesus. He was willing to give up his life for Jesus because for him, dying for and dying with Jesus is a great gain. Now we are told to focus on Jesus from start to finish. We are told to hold on to Jesus no matter what hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 we must focus on jesus the source and goal of our faith 
He saw the joy ahead of him. So he endured death on the cross and ignored the disgrace it brought him. Now he holds the honored position, the one next to God, the Father on the heavenly throne. Now let me just call your attention first to these words. <clears throat> he saw, or he endured, he saw the joy ahead of him, he endured death on the cross and ignored the disgrace brought him. I want all of us just to focus on that word. Now, why is that? Why is that? Why did Jesus endure the cross and ignored the disgrace? Why is that? The answer is because Jesus saw the value in dying on the cross. He saw the value. Now look at this. Let me point your attention to the word. He saw the joy ahead of him. He endured death. He ignored the disgrace because he saw something of value ahead of him. And what is that value? What is it that he saw? The joy. There is joy in his death. And he saw that. He saw that in his death, there is joy. There is something of value in his death. And what is that something of value? Let me focus your attention. It says, honored position, the one next to God. That's what he saw when he was right there on the cross. He saw the joy in dying because at last, he would be back to where he first came from, in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. Finally, finally, that's why Jesus said it is finished. Finally, he is going back home. He saw that joy. He saw the value in dying to all of us. And when he did that, it was a joy to him. Can you imagine somebody dying for you? Having that joy in his heart? I have not seen or I have not heard any story. Somebody dying and uttering the words, I am enjoying this. None. But Jesus, that's why he's one of a kind. He saw the joy in his death. Why? Because he's doing it for you. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you very much. How much? This much. He died for you this much. Sure about that. Now, in verse uh, 2 and 3, it tells us we must focus on Jesus. Now, in verse 3, he said, think about Jesus. Focus on your visitor. Focus on Jesus Christ that's in your heart right now. Think about Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Those words, it's not just a matter of thought up here in our mind. No. What the author is trying to tell us is when you focus on Jesus, when you think about Jesus, he is talking about Jesus being your priority. Jesus being your life. Jesus being the center of your life. It is therefore living your life with Jesus. It is not just a mere thought, but it is more of doing and living. Now, why is it a priority? Why? Because Jesus is the very object of your faith. He is the very object of my faith. Now, you see the words, the source and goal of our faith. What does that mean? 
It means that Jesus is the reason for your faith. The beginning of your faith. The source of your faith. The source of why you have that faith, that faith in the first place. And Jesus is the goal. What does that mean? Jesus is the goal of your faith. It means that Jesus is also the reason why you will die holding on to your faith. Because when you die, you will have the life. You will have that life because your obedient faith has caused you to die to this life. And your real life is hidden with Christ Jesus. That's why our faith, we hold on to Jesus Christ because it is the source, he is the source, and he is the goal of our faith. So focus on Jesus. Now there are times, there will be time in our journey with God when we might lose a bit on our focus. Then we need to refocus. In Luke chapter 10, 41, Jesus said, Martha, Martha. The Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. You know, so many things that can take up your time. So many things that can take you away from God. And this is what the Bible called backsliding. Moving away from God, from being near God. And there would come a time in your journey in life with God, that you will lose that grip on God. You will somehow take a backslide, you know, and wander off from God. Now, the book of James 5 verse 19 tells us the concept of backsliding. Any person who has Jesus and wanders from the truth, who wanders away from Jesus, should be restored. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back. Backsliding or turning our backs from God sometimes happens because of many things. And Martha, Martha, when she saw the opportunity, she grabbed the opportunity, she opened the door, but in the midst of it all, in the midst of that Jesus being in her house, she was distracted. She was distracted. And believe me and trust me, you too can be distracted and can be taken away from God. And there are so many ways, so many things that can distract us. But one common, one common thing that distracts us, according to survey, is wealth, money. Okay. I asked uh, many years ago, I asked a couple of people what distracts them from uh, continuing with God. Wealth, money, and the second thing is health. The third thing is family. You know, Jesus is straightforward. He tells his audience, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and man. Believers backslide because we lose focus on God. Again, we are, uh, we are to focus on God. We are to prioritize God. And this is what Jesus is telling us right now. He was telling the audience back then, and he was and he's telling us today that we must prioritize him over anything else. He's not telling us to prioritize other things than him. No. And he's not even telling us to have both. No, you cannot prioritize both. There's no such thing. There's no both number one. Number one, then number two. Okay. It's either you serve God or you don't. 
And Jesus Christ is telling the audience and, and is telling us right now that we must serve him first. Prioritize him first. It is never both. Because, man's, because of man's thought of not having enough and his fear, man's fear of not having enough, we fall short of our faith in Jehovah Jireh. So we backslide. Number one, the thought of not having enough. That you don't have enough resources to support your family. Okay. If you have that thought that you don't have enough, your faith is shaken. And then we prioritize wealth over God. We sacrifice our time with God because we want to have enough. Now, all of us here in this room and in our Zoom, here is a rhetorical question. Now, just think about this question and answer it for ourselves. Is it true that once in your life, you don't have enough to support your family? Let me repeat the question. Is it true that once in your life, you don't have enough to support your family? As if God falls short of his provisions to you. Or maybe, just maybe, you did not have enough to support your family because you squander God's blessings. Because you put to waste God's blessing, that's why you don't have enough. Now, let me be frank, in all honesty, my dear brethren and friends, God never falls short of his blessings to us. He never falls short of his blessings to us. It is he, it is we, sorry, it is we who fall short on how to acquire and use these blessings from God. And then the second one is when we fear that we might not have enough to support our family, it means that you have enough at the moment, right? You have enough for the moment, but the thought of the future, your children's education, the inflations, the increase in prices, healthcare, you know, those things have taken control of our lives and therefore we sacrifice our time, we sacrifice our relationship with God over these things and therefore we backslide and sometimes i've heard many people even believers who would hide and shelter in discomfort words when they say you know brother mike i know god would understand me i know that he knows that i need to work god knows i need to do this i need to do that for my family he is an understanding god he would understand me but here's my question. The question is not that God doesn't understand you. Believe me, he does. He understands you. That's why, you know, you look around you. You look around. God provided for us everything that you need. Everything is all there. It's for us. To the taking now the real question is do you understand god that is the real question god understands us that's why you have what you have that's why god has given us everything but the real question is do you understand god in the following verse jesus said therefore i tell you do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink or about your body what you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes now look at the word of Jesus Christ. He said, therefore. The word therefore is a what they call a conjunctive adverb. It links two thoughts. It connects two thoughts. Okay? The cause and effect. Now we know in verse 24 that Jesus Christ is telling us to put God first. That's what he's telling us in verse 24. Put God first. Prioritize God first. That's the cause. Now the effect, verse 25. Therefore, Jesus said, what is the effect? If you will put God first, Jesus said, you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about your life. If you have me, 
I am enough for you. You don't have to worry. That is the cause and effect. When you have God, Jesus said, therefore, you do not have to worry. And look at the words, I tell you. What does it mean? Those three little words. What does it mean? I tell you. Okay. It is Jesus asking and telling us, do you know who I am? I tell you, do you know who I am? If you know who I am, then you will not have to worry because I am, I tell you. If we believe in Jesus for what he is and for who he is, Jesus is telling us, I tell you, you don't need to be afraid. Again, if you know Jesus Christ, if you know that he has that power, that he has that authority, Jesus is telling you, I tell you. It is about his power. It is about his authority. I tell you. Now, I intentionally wrote a while ago the word Jehovah Jireh because it means the Lord will provide. You know, because many have forgotten this name character of God because we are so shaken by life's worry, by anxiety with so many things, we have forgotten this character of God that he is the great provider. Now, if we are backsliding for whatever reason, we need to refocus. We need to go back to God. And we need to understand that God is who he is, that he is the great provider, that he will provide everything. And finally, Luke 10, 42, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. When you refocus, when you backslide, try to refocus and try to think again about Jesus Christ. For Jesus said, I am the most important. Mary chose what is important, and that is Jesus Christ. Now, Martha, he was upset and worried about many things, while Mary focuses only on Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus said the only thing, the only one thing is needed. The only one thing is needed, and that is Jesus Christ. The only one thing that you need in your life is Jesus Christ, the I am, the authority. Now, this teaches us the principle of all the, the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. It means that Jesus is enough for all of us. That's why Jesus is the most important in all of life. Jesus is sufficient. Jesus is enough because he saves. Acts 4.12. Jesus is enough. Jesus is sufficient because he provides. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. If you are lacking, if you lack anything, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. I remember Paul asked Jesus Christ three times to take away the thorn in his flesh. Three times. But Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you. If you feel you are lacking of anything, refocus. Think about your faith. Think about Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, I am enough for you. He is sufficient enough for all of us. When you have Jesus, if you have Jesus in your life, you have everything that you need. So why are we shaken in our faith? Refocus to the one thing that is more important, Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus never promises us beds of roses. But in times of our difficulties, we can count on Jesus Christ because he is enough for all of us. My dear friends and brethren, and those, especially those who have not yet accepted the Lord, 
Jesus is offering himself to you. He is sufficient. He is enough for you. We want you to come and accept the Lord by repenting of your sins, turning away from your sins, and focusing on God. And be immersed as we have commanded, as commanded by God. Be immersed, be baptized into water for the remission of our sins. The gospel is yours. Blessed good morning to everybody. Shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation?